Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 9. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Eric, and again, welcome to the Santa Clarita Adventist Church today. We are observing all the rules, so to speak, and so there are very few individuals that are here with me today, and I just want to thank each one of them again for their participation in making this service possible so that we can all see it on the internet. It was indeed this week when... um, Through the power of using Zoom, we had a meeting with the conference uh, on Zoom, and we were instructed at that time by the conference that they were shutting down all the churches of the Southern California Conference. So it's not just a decision by our board or myself. This is something that our conference has asked us to cooperate with, and that's why I'm really glad that we, we have the internet uh, the ability then to to uh, be together virtually, and uh, that 's what we 're planning to do this Sabbath and the two following Sabbaths. If the situation is changed we 're going to let you know in good time, and that 's again why i 'm asking that you forward your email to uh, Amy so that she can uh, be in touch with you. I want to confess something this morning that it has been interesting, maybe even a little frustrating for me this year to come up with ideas for what it is that we as a congregation need to be focusing on at this time. And voila, here comes COVID-19. It's interesting to me because we as a Adventist people have a a focus on the future, and that has affected my life, uh, being a lifelong Adventist, and it has uh, given much pause to what will come. I have a grandfather and a father before me who preached about crazy things happening in the end times. I just want to agree with the several of my friends that uh, this is not the end. If anything, it may be the birth pains. Uh, Lots of people are looking at the fact that this is a global event. Well, I'm going to talk about that this morning in the context of our subject today, which is the beginning of a five-part series leading up to uh, the Sabbath when I hope we can be together, uh, Easter Sabbath, uh, and On that day, we will be dealing with the S of sanctuary. There are five S's that are very special to Adventism. 
And right in our name, the very first one is Sabbath. So even though I did not know that we would be meeting in this fashion, I'm wanting us to focus in the next five weeks on some of these special pieces that I believe come through in the mission and message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So if you're meeting with us on the internet, you are not a regular member here, we welcome you and we hope that this will be of interest to you. I want you to turn in your Bibles to uh, Psalm chapter 46. This is a a family psalm for my family. Uh, We used to repeat this psalm on a Sabbath by Sabbath basis uh, growing up, so I know it by heart in the King James Version, but my New International reads like this, that God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, and, and, and if you want to do a fist pump with me, we will not fear. Though the earth give way to a virus and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God, the the holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, or nations are shut down. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, uh, see the works of the Lord, the desolations He has brought on the earth. He, He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and He shatters the spear and He burns the shields with fire. And here's here's the verse that just really is ringing in my ears this morning as we do not have a congregation here and we have the opportunity to be in our homes and just being still. Verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the King James says, is with us, and the God of Jacob is our fortress, is our, is our refuge, is our shelter in these times. The Lord Almighty, the God of Jacob. This is reminiscent of the promises that have been made to God's people. The Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob promise is also made to us. people of Israel were in Egypt for over 430 years. By his righteous right arm, God says, he brings the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, and he brings them through the desert, and he takes them to a land that was their ancestors. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name then was changed to Israel. So, as we think about Sabbath, and we think about the giving of what we know to be the Ten Commandments, which is where most of our minds go when we use the word Sabbath, I want us to to maybe rethink a little bit this morning of, of how Sabbath affects us today, and maybe how we are thinking of it, and that maybe by going first to where uh, the people of Israel were when God gave them the, the Ten Commandments, we can come up with maybe a new understanding or a revised understanding or maybe an understanding that would be more helpful for this pandemic that we are all part of at this moment. So I like to 
crunch things down into a sentence or two for you and say, Sabbath marks a life of faith. And let that just sink in for a moment. Sabbath marks a life of faith. Choosing life means choosing the life giver. Living the life given by the Creator comes with instructions. Again, the picture in your mind right now should be that the people of Israel are all at the base of Mount Sinai and God is visiting with Moses. There is smoke. There is trembling rocks. The people have been told in no uncertain terms in Exodus 19 particularly, do not approach. Do not force your way. So it's very interesting to me that that, uh, God, when he wants to make a relationship with his people, he understands his people. He does not want his people to be hurt. He wants them to know that he is who he is, the great God of the universe, but he does not want them to uh, take on the idea that, that he is like them. He is different from them. He wants to protect them. And so he says, stay back. Stay back. Don't force your way into my presence unless I invite you. The only person invited was was Moses. So as as we look at this idea, Sabbath marking the life of faith, we go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, while while Psalm 46 is ringing in our ears, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, and right there uh, we hear a lot about the individuals that are in our minds right now. I have them marked in my Bible with with colored pencil. There's, let's see, who, who do we have? We have Abel, we have Enoch, we have Noah, we have Abram or Abraham. And in front of this, the writer of Hebrews says, by faith, by faith. So as we are uh, in this, the midst of this pandemic, as we are thinking about this whole idea of Sabbath, I'm wanting you to sort of hold these, these pictures in your mind that here the people of Israel are about to receive instructions about the relationship that they are to have with the, the God of the universe, and in doing so, he, then if we jump way forward, we can also see that, that it is by faith, by faith, that these individuals, even though, verse Uh, 13, even though they were aliens and strangers on earth. They looked towards verse 16. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly, a heavenly country. My friends, uh, Sabbath has been a big part of my life. Uh, as I said, I, I've been in the church all my life. I, I, I really don't know what it's like to, to not have Sabbath in my life. I also want you to know that I'm very glad that this is a topic that is huge in the world today. I think that this pandemic could be looked at as a Sabbath. Maybe one that's been imposed upon us. Imposed upon the entire world. In some respects, you, you have the entire human race on planet Earth, at the base of the mountain right now. We're waiting to see what will happen. And there are those of us who really, really want to know what God is going to do here. I, th- I think if we, if we look at the situation in this context, we realize that God is wanting a relationship with each and every one of us and that he's wanting that relationship to be in its proper place and its proper time. He doesn't want us to force ourselves upon him. He certainly is not going to force himself upon us. He says to us, remember in Psalm 46, be still. 
be still. So here we are, we're resting in our homes, we're maybe even in our pajamas still, we're, we're thinking, oh, this is really great. I, I don't have to get all dressed up to go to church. And no, you don't, and that's just fine. But you know what? God is with us. He is with each and every one of us, and he is saying to us, be still. I am God, he is saying. I am the creator. I have been and continue to be your liberator. I'm, I'm that God. I'm, I'm the God who brings you out of the land of slavery. I'm a God who brings you out of the land where people separate each other because they are different races or different ethnicities. I'm, I'm bringing you out of the land where there is trust in ourselves. And I really want... I really want us to connect that idea with Hebrews 11 this morning because all these patriarchs, all this this Hebrews 11 list of people, they're all listed as having faith and that this is what sets them apart from all other humanity. This is what sets them apart for God. I'm heartened by the phrase that is used in in Exodus 19 where God says, I want you to be my treasured possession. I want you to know that, that you are very, very special to me and I'm going to use you to be a blessing to the rest of the world. Believing in that, even today, my friends, takes faith. So I'm, I'm wanting to blend these two ideas where we have the people waiting to hear what God wants from them in their relationship and the instructions that they have with the fact that the people who had come before them, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Enoch, Abel, they had all had to have faith. Faith in things that they could not see. In, in, in our text uh, earlier, we read the fact that that we, we realize that if we believe in this God, this God who has saved us out of Egypt, this creator God, then we are saying we believe in a God who can create out of nothing, nothing that we know of, nothing that we can claim. That, that this is, this is a, a God that we don't know in that intimate human, in that intimate human sense. But he's saying to us today, here's the deal. You will be my people, my treasured possession, and I will be your God. I will be your king, your your Lord. Live in my system, and you will enjoy the blessings. Well, my friends, if we just do a little history lesson very quickly, um, uh, because it is so important, I think, at this very moment, where, again, I'm saying... Could it be that this virus has caused a global Sabbath? Starting with King Saul and going forward 490 years, we see an Israel who did not obey. You see, the God who brought them out of the one financial, economic, uh, social system known as Egypt brought them into a land promised to their ancestors as being the place where they would live and where they would grow and where they would flourish and where they would be the, the kind of people that others could point to and say, you know, when you trust God, When you operate in God's economic system, when you operate in God's social system, this is what it looks like. I know that uh, at other times you could say that that we we have been uh, dubbed the, the witnesses that God wants us to be. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. So if you're thinking this is just Old Testament language, Old Testament idea, then please understand that Jesus reiterates right away when he is leaving that our uh, place in his kingdom right now is to be a people who will witness to the benefits of being part of his kingdom in the here and now. So beginning with King Saul 
And moving on 490 years, there was a system that God put in place of Sabbath. Sabbaths and Sabbaths, we, we, we talk about this in the New Testament, we talk about it in the Old Testament, and in this case, I'm referring to every seven years. Not just every seven days, but every seven years, there was to be a year where the ground would be untilled, it would lie fallow, and God said, I will provide for you. You do not need to provide for yourselves. I will provide for you. The, 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 the ground will get, what do we say in English? I think also maybe in Spanish, <laughs> we will give the ground a Sabbath, a sabbatical. One problem. They never, in those 490 years, almost 500 years, they never kept one of those years. So at the end of those years, who comes along to execute the will of God as per his own words is Nebuchadnezzar. My servant, Nebuchadnezzar, comes along and takes the people of Israel captive back to Babylon where they stayed for, you're right, 70 years. How many Seven-year periods in 490 years? Seventy. So uh, we learn that God gets what he needs out of this world one way or t'other. He pulls his people out of the land. He lets the land lie fallow for 70 years as he intended and he supports his people in Babylon where he says in Jeremiah, you will be a blessing while you're part of that economic system, while you're in this foreign country known as Babylon, you will be a blessing there. And, 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 and then you will come back, but it will only be a remnant of you. It will, it will not be all of you who will make it back because you see, 70 years, uh, have we not seen this to be something that God has, has promised? I was just talking to one of our members uh, this week and he's, he's definitely older than 70, but doesn't the Bible say that, you know, what God would like us to have is three score and 10? Well, if a score is 20 and 10 is 10, then you've got 70 years. So I was asking, you know, how long do we think is a long life? When somebody dies when they're 35, we say, oh, it was too soon. Who says that 35 is too soon and 70 is, 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 is what we should be aiming for when nowadays there are 70-year-olds who would say, I'm still young. And, 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 and in fact, this gentleman that I was speaking with is feeling a lot better. He just had some surgery, and he's feeling a lot better, and he's, he's getting around a lot more, and I, I believe uh, this year he will be 88. Double eights. It's a good number in Chinese. Very, very auspicious number. God says, I'm God. I'm the creator. I'm your liberator. Here's the deal. You will be my people, and I will be your God. Live in my system, and you will enjoy the blessings. But they didn't listen. And so God took them out of the land for the required amount of time, and his word did not return to him void. It returned to him accomplished. They returned to, 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 to rebuild Jerusalem after those 70 years. They returned to set up the system that brought about trust in God or was supposed to be witnessing to trust in God. What do we call trust in God today? We call it faith. If we want to be like the people, of his, uh, people in, in, in the Hebrews 11 uh, Hall of Fame chapter to have faith, then we need to be people who trust in God, especially in the time of a global pandemic. We need to be saying, we trust in God. Once again, the sentence that we are looking at today is that Sabbath marks a life of faith. 
Choosing life means choosing the life giver, the, tree, the, the creator God. So I say that the coronavirus provides the world with an opportunity to take a breath. An opportunity to reaffirm our trust in God. An opportunity to take refuge, like Psalm 46, to take refuge in our relationship with God. Instead of refuge in our own ideas. I say this very carefully because it is the difference, really, between those who trust God and those who don't. Because if you're not trusting God, you're trusting someone else. And if that person is you or anyone else, it's not God. So I think that's what COVID-19 has brought to us, is this opportunity to, do, to, to, to be in our pajamas it, at, at home, listening to the preacher with our Bibles on our laps and saying, oh my goodness, this is an opportunity to say, I'm just going to be still and know that he is God. It's a Sabbath. It's an opportunity to trust. It's an opportunity for us to, to stand or sit or praise the God of the universe, our Father in heaven. As a As an Adventist, when we think about the doctrine of the Sabbath, that it is in our name, seventh day, I know you may have thought that my sermon today would be about how we need to be seventh day people. Well, I'm very happy to help expand that view with you today that it is more important, based on Hebrews 11, that we be trusting in God and that when we keep Sabbath, when we have Sabbath in our life, that it is a mark of the fact that we do trust God, that we do want to be part of His global economy, the way in which we act, the what, what we speak is reflective of the fact that we are card-carrying members of the kingdom of God right now. That's why I'm thinking that, that this is a moment that we can take to invite our family and our friends to gather around the family altar, to gather around and to thank God for the way that he has taken care of us. I, I'm thinking nationally right now and thinking the fact that God has blessed America so abundantly we are such a blessing to so many parts of the world as well. But right now we have an opportunity to say, where did all of that come from? Where did all that blessing come from? And we can say, praise God, from whom all blessings flow and I believe that all of this is encapsulated in many ways in the idea of Sabbath. That's why I'm saying, I think sitting back and taking a breath because of this virus thing has given us all the opportunity to have a worldwide Sabbath. So I, for one, am very glad for this opportunity to, to say, I'm going to be taking the time. I'm going to be taking the time to, to share Sabbath, to share this idea of trusting in God that that Sabbath was put into place. As the people of Israel were there at the basis, he says, remember. Remember that I created the Sabbath and that I gave it to you, not so that you would be Im impeded in your progress, but just to remind you that, that you can put down, put down your need to take care of yourself. Don't be Nebuchadnezzar. Don't look out upon your world and say, look at this thing that I have made. Because remember what happened. 
the moment he did that. God took away all the brains that he had had in order to make his beautiful kingdom. So this is the moment, folks. This is the moment to share the idea that Sabbath, this peace in our name, seventh day, the Sabbath idea is not just the day. It's not just not Sunday. It's, it's bigger. It's way bigger. It's the kingdom of God. It's, it's about trust. It's about faith. I'm going to share this idea until I die because I believe that this is what the God of heaven and earth, the God who made me and made you, would want us to do. He would want us to trust in Him both now and forever. Amen and amen. And may God make this opportunity something that brings Him glory and honor and praise from so many lips around the world that those who do not know him will look at those who do and say, how can you be so calm? How can you not be worried? Why are you not going to the, to the grocery stores and stripping the shelves? Why are you not doing this? Because you are trusting that God will bless, God will take care, that God has control of the situation. May this be our experience here in Santa Clarita and in the whole world. Amen.